I just checked in, which gives us five board members. So we are going to begin. Hey, Oscar. Hey there. Um, great. So let's call a meeting to order at 5.32 p.m. Uh, roll call. We have board members Tavilla and Jesswin, Metcher, Lieberman, De La Torre, and Keen here. Uh, we're yeah, expecting board member Leon Vasquez. I'm on. Oh, we do have board member Leon Vasquez. Perfect. And we will not have board member Foster with us tonight. Where's we she? have six board members present. Um, before, uh, yeah, I guess we'll start with the pledge. So uh, if, if uh, everybody wants to take part in the pledge, we will do that together. Um, please observe it in the manner that you are most comfortable with. So if you're comfortable, place your hand on your heart and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Um, now that we've done the pledge, I'd like to open the meeting. Um, we, there, there, there's so much bad <laughs> that seems to be going on every day and I'd like to um, at least open the meeting with one breath or a couple breaths of good news that we've gotten this week. Um, and it came from an odd source. The Supreme Court upheld the civil rights of uh, our brothers and sisters um, uh, in, uh, in the LGBTQ community um, and the trans community. And even more exciting today, this, the Supreme Court upheld the rights of our dreamers, um, deferred action to childhood arrivals. Um, it, it, it's it, you know it's like we're so we're so used to bad news coming in that when something good happens it, it takes you back for a second. But for these seven hundred thousand individuals, at least it's a it, it, hopefully they can breathe a little easier. Um, and in this day and age, we know the the value of breath. Um, which brings me to the one bit of sad news that we're just going to keep bringing it up in the beginning of meetings. We're going to open this meeting in honor of Rayshard Brooks and uh, all other victims of systemic racism in our society. So please think of Mr. Brooks and other victims of this scourge as we open our meeting. That said, um, we'd like to add one item to our agenda for the approval. Um, so we would like to, uh, we have to add it because it was less than 72 hours. I'd like to add item C3, adopt resolution number 1950, recognizing and celebrating Juneteenth. We had meant to have this on the agenda for the meeting before, uh, it did not happen. Um, so we'd like to add this to our agenda tonight. I need um, to do a roll call vote to make this happen. Richard has his hand up as a yes. Ralph? Ralph is a yes. Uh, Lori is a yes. Oscar I was, is a yes. I was, moving, I was moving to add it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So I guess we've got to do that too. <laughs> Richard moved it and Ralph added it, seconded it. And we've already got one, two, three, four votes, five votes, Maria, and I'm a yes also. So thank you for adding that, which now allows us to approve the agenda as amended. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda with that added? I see Oscar and seconded by Maria. Um, so we will do the quick roll call on this, Richard, Ralph, Lori. Yes. Oscar. Yes. Maria. Yes. And I'm a yes too. Thank you all very much. And now we'll move to our time stamped items. Our first time stamp item tonight is uh, agenda item C1, uh, uh, public hearing for 2020-21 COVID-19 operations. This is a public hearing. Do I have a motion to open the public hearing? by Maria, seconded by Richard. Roll call vote to open the public hearing. Richard? Ralph? It's a yes. Maria? Yes. There's a yes. Lori? Yes. I'm a yes. The public hearing is now open and I will uh, give the floor to Dr. Mora. Thank you. So I'm, I will be sharing my screen um, with all of you. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Good um, evening, um, board president, members of the board, Dr. Drotty, cabinet and guests. Um, today is just a quick update on uh, the COVID-19 operations written report. Uh, as, we, as we had reviewed at our last board meeting, I had shared with, um, with, with the board and with our public that we would be reviewing it once again prior to bringing it for public hearing to make any adjustments based on feedback from um, our board and or the LCAP DCC that would be reviewing this, um, this document. So at this time, I wanted to just share just a few adjustments that were made um, by section. 
So in section one, we, um, we added additional information on webinars that were provided for families. There were um, various sessions that really focused on um, the health and well-being of families during this time period. So those, those webinars were offered both in English and Spanish. And in addition, there was support to all of our, to our advisory groups, our DLAC, ELAC, School Sign Council, LCAP PAC, in order to support families in learning the various um, platforms that we, we have been implementing in order to continue that engagement and these conversations. We had also um, expanded on the description of the teaching and learning working groups and their tasks. So you'll find that in the first section. We wanted to just clarify that the task for these groups, um, both at the district level, the district leadership and principal working group and the teaching and learning working group that is that um, encompasses teachers, counselors, um, SMCTA representatives, and members of our teaching and learning council, um, as well as district leadership and principal representatives. Um, they are being tasked to really develop a plan of action um, around the possible models for us to um, consider as we think of and plan for fall 2020. So their work is to really um, be able to create and bring coherence and clear expectations around teaching and learning as it relates to distance learning, hybrid models, and in, in, in the building um, in-person um, learning. So that was, that was added to this particular section. Sections two, um, we, we decided to just include the community fundraising efforts that took place um, to support families in need, especially families who uh, needed, who were food, um, food were, were needed of additional supports with, with food and meals. So this is something that we wanted to include and just recognize our, our larger community who really came together during this time to support our most vulnerable families. And lastly, section three, four, and five, there were no major adjustments. But you will see if you reread this report, um, we tried to make sure to clean up any typos or any grammatical errors that may have been included in the original document. And that also was then translated to make sure that our families who preferred to read the document in Spanish or whose, who, um, whose primary language is Spanish, then they had that available for them um, prior to this meeting. So then our next steps at this point is to uh, move forward with the approval of the COVID-19 operations written report at our next board meeting, which is on 625. And um, I will just open it up in, in case there are any questions or comments from, from our board members. Great. Thank you, Dr. Moore. We have no public comments. Do we have any board member comments or questions on this item? Yes, Oscar. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, through the Pico Youth and Family Center, we have a young man uh, named Ashel. He's a uh, 11th grader at Santa Monica High and he came up with an idea to support uh, vulnerable seniors in the Pico neighborhood and we, uh, we're, go we're, we're working on our fifth round this Sunday. So that'll be more than 148 uh, seniors that, um, that we'll be delivering food and essential items to and this is just another great example of a Samuel High student taking leadership and uh, getting us to do the right thing and, and we're very excited about that. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. So like I said, we need all the good news we can get. Um, so with that said, do I have a motion to close our public hearing? So moved, moved by uh, Lori, seconded by Oscar. Roll call. Richard? Aye. Yeah, Ralph? Lori? Yes. Oscar? Yes. Maria? Yes. And I'm a yes also. I believe that since we're voting on this at the next meeting on the 6, uh, 625 that we don't need to vote on anything tonight. So we will then move on to our second time stamp right. item. This one being voted next week, the budget. That's what being Dr. Voted. Morris says. Yeah. Approval. Yes. 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 Yep. All of yep. them next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I trust that more than me. <laughs> um, C2 timestamp for public hearing 2020 21 proposed budget. So for this, I will introduce Melody Kennedy. I moved to open the hearing. Do we know? Oh, do that? yes, we have to do that. Thank you, Richard. Do I have a second to open the hearing? Maria. Sorry, I forgot it's a public hearing. Roll call vote. Richard. Yes. Ralph. Ralph, thumbs up. Uh, Lori. Yes. Oscar's a thumbs up. Maria. Yes. And I'm a yes also. So our public meeting is now open. Thank you for reminding me, Richard. And now we go to Melody Kennedy. 
Good evening, Board um, President Keene, uh, board members, Dr. Jotty, uh, fellow cabinet members, and um, the community. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to be able to present to you the um, proposed budget for 2021. I'm gonna share my screen here, just a moment, and get us started. There we go. I gotta hide everybody's faces for a minute because it gets in the way. Okay. So um, this is our public hearing for a proposed general fund budget for 2021. And it's not moving. <laughs> okay. Um, tonight we will discuss our budget process, the LCFF budget assumptions, the LCFF calculation, our multi-year projections, our ending fund balance and reserve, um, the cash flow and the trans, and um, what we'll be doing for next steps. So part of the budget process um, each year, it's, a, it's a, um, a cycle that we go through every single year. In January, we um, actually look to see what the governor's proposed budget is and start kind of working from that, that point forward. And um, we're looking at our enrollment projections uh, somewhere around February. Um, in January and February, um, we're having discussions at the board and cabinet levels regarding um, any kind of budget changes that we see coming for the, for the next year. And then um, we do site and department and staffing meetings in February and March as well. And then um, for the current um, year projections and data entry, we do all of that in April and May, trying to um, cram everything in to get it done as quickly as we can. And, uh oh, I just lost it. What happened here? It's like somebody else is sharing the screen. Let me see if I can go back. Perhaps and share. start over. That was kind of odd. Um, here I am. That was odd. Okay. Um, our preliminary budget um, projections are, are done um, May or early June, and then we do the budget adoption here at the end of June. So for our budget assumptions, what, what we have is um, our um, total enrollment at this time, um, we're assuming is um, 10,018, um, which is 272 less than 2019-20. And then on our average daily attendance, we have um, approximately 9,683.21, um, 9 or 95% of our, of our um, student population um, as our average daily attendance. Um, unduplicated count for ELLs and the foster use of, of to be free reduced in foster is 28.56. And then um, we have a cost of living adjustment of a negative 10% at this time until um, we know a little bit more about the, um, how the legislators are going to do that. That's where we're having to, to go at this point. Our total LCF F funding is $80,682,731. Um, included in the LCFF dollars is the supplemental LCAP funding, um, which is kind of important to, to the um, item you had before us, uh, before this item, and $3,926,759. So um, our local control funding formula is calculated um, based on the information you see in front of you. So this is for 2021, and this is on the base grant here. Um, and we have included that 10% less within these numbers. So the numbers that you see here is TK through three, four through six, seven through eight, and nine through 12. Those are all grade levels. Um, these are the number of students that we have within those particular grade levels, and then the dollar amounts that are actually assigned to, to those grade levels, um, giving us um, the totals that you see here um, each, in each one of these particular columns, um, giving us a total overall for base grant of $73,119,409. Um, within this calculation, there's also augmentation grants, and um, that's a class size reduction augmentation um, base grant, and that comes out at $1,880,224. And then we have the CTE augmentation for um, grades 9 through 12, and that is 619,948. And then for the supplemental uh, grant, which I just mentioned to you a moment ago, <clears throat> excuse me, a moment ago, you can kind of see how they do the calculation there. And it's a total enrollment over three years average. And then um, the unduplicated count is also in a three-year um, average. 
Um, this gives us a total of $3,926,759 for a supplemental grant. And for transportation and the TIG grant, um, for transportation, we get $745,703. And then for the um, targeted instructional improvement block grant, which is called TIG, um, $390,688. Um, that brings us into a, a total LCFF for 2021 entitlement of $80,682,731. Um, what they do is have us subtract back out the seven million eight hundred five thousand seven excuse me, seven million eight hundred and five five three one two um, and giving us a total um, fund balance. Um, of $72,877,419. Um, then what happens is, um, and if you're, a, if you're not a basic aid district, this doesn't even mean much to, 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 that, to anybody. However, for us as being basic aid, this does mean something. So we have to take our local revenue and property taxes and um, um, of 94216000 subtract it from that 72.8, and that gives us a total of 21,339,402. That is the depth of our, of our basic aid at this, at this point in time is the 21.3 um, million. So some recommended multi-year projections um, for 2021 on revenues, we adjusted the RDA um, from 15 million to 16.4 million to align with the auditor controller's property tax estimates. So at third, um, at third revision, this projection was um, previously um, from 15 million to 17 million. So there's been a little bit of um, flopping back and forth there. Um, we had significant decrease to the education protection account um, for the current year, which was uh, 488,000 and possibly a 10% 10, 10 reduction or more for the 2021, which you'll see whenever we go into the multi-year projections. Then um, all other property tax categories are estimated to be a 5% increase in their own separate categories as recommended by um, basic aid districts instead of a lump sum percentage increase. And then um, for measure Y and GSA, it is projected to, to significantly decrease um, to $12,537,500 from the city of Santa Monica. So this projection reflects approximately a 14% decrease due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, as well as any um, climate of the civil unrest that, that we're um, experiencing. This projection um, mirrors the city's financial estimates per the um, advisement of our, our district's financial oversight committee, which we just met, um, um, we just met last week. Um, so on expenses, we have an increase in certificated and classified hourly um, overtime substitute costs. Um, we're incorporate because the, the, the substitute costs and all of those others were incorporated back into the 2021 um, budget um, that were reduced in the prior, in this particular year um, due in the third budget revision. Um, and that, that was a big piece of COVID. Um, there was a lot of savings there. Uh, includes an offset of the counselors. Um, we also include um, uh, an offset of counselors' salaries, benefits with um, lottery revenues at $1.4 million. Um, includes an offset also of the expenses for the Malibu fundraising entity um, programs. In other words, we won't be um, backfilling. We'll be, um, whatever revenue we get, that's the amount of, of expenses that we'll use. And then um, we, we did a decrease in textbook costs at $2 million. So for our local general fund contribution, um, we had an increase in our special ed contribution by $1.7 million from 2019-20 to the 2021 year. Um, we continue to, um, to add in our child development contribution of $1 million beginning in 2019-20. Um, and that is for a five-year period with an additional $200,000 from the LCAP supplement um, grant for a total of $1.2 million. We continue with the food services contribution at this time of $900,000. And then we have an increase of deferred maintenance contribution by $250,000, bringing that to a total of $1 million for the 2021 year. Still required, we are still required to have a 3% match for routine restricted maintenance account and that is at $5.8 million. 
And then we have a total inter, inter fund transfer of $3.1 million, not including our special ed and our routine restricted maintenance account. For multi-year projections, I'm actually gonna pull that up for us so that we can look at it this way. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, within there, we have, um, we have our numbers system here, and it's um, one through, this is becoming a really long sheet, now 82. So lines one through 82. And I've kind of cut this down a little bit so it's not so large for you to see, but what you see in your packet is it's got uh, five years worth, so you'll, you can see all of the, um, the back years in it. But we're gonna um, look at columns F through J, and I'm actually not gonna spend much time, I'm not really gonna spend any time, honestly, in F and, and G. I am going to um, talk about H because that's what we hear, we're here for, and then I and J um, will follow suit. So as you can see, the property tax are coming in a little bit higher than what we, we anticipated from uh, 1920, and, and that's due to that 5% increase that we were talking about. And then you'll see that 5% um, actually being sliced in all the way across each one of those particular years. For um, line two for the EPA or the educational protection account, um, that is actually um, has, the reason that that is highlighted in yellow is to remind us that that has that 10% um, negative COLA um, added in there. That's usually coming in about $2 million every year. However, with that 10% cut, um, we are trying to be conservative and be able to, to, to place that in there. Then on minimum state aid is another one that the 10%, um, the negative 10% is um, kind of rearing its head. And we, we normally see about 8.5 million, now it's at 7.8. We've carried that across to the next year, not in, from 2021 to 2122 as well. Not knowing for sure if it's going to um, actually happen here, and we'll make those adjustments as that happens. However, we went back to um, hopefully times will be better in 22, 23, so we've made a projection and left, and left that, that number whole as it was in 1920. So that gives us our total LCFF funding, as we, we discussed before, slightly increasing, and once again, due to that 5% increase um, within property tax. Um, other notable things to discuss here is lottery. That does um, cause a decrease in lottery as well with that negative 10%. So it went from 1.6 million to 1.4 million, a um, little bit over $1.4 million. Carried that again across over to 21, 22. Um, looking at um, 22, 23, we're not actually adding that 10% reduction in there. Then um, the mandated reimbursement block grant, um, that has, we, we have a decrease in that as well. Um, in, the, in the estimated, we're looking at 422,665. However, with the 10% decrease, um, we have um, booked it at 372,727, once again, carrying that across. Then if we go down to um, line 14, let me kind of scroll this up a little bit so folks can follow along. Follow along. Um, measure Y and GSH, which is the um, city of Santa Monica um, taxes, is um, at a 14% four, um, decrease compared to what we've had in, in the past. Um, we do have that basically reflected in here. It's not a full 14%, but we do have the reflection in here. Um, we're usually looking at about 15 million, and so we've made that adjustment in our estimated. Um, but if you take that 14%, 14 it comes out to, um, or a negative 14%, it comes out to 12,537,500. Once again, carried it into the next year, kind of not really knowing what number to do. We did, however, carry it into um, the third year out. And I know that these numbers will probably be changed, will be, um, it, it could even change by the time we go for adopted here. Um, but we'll talk about um, um, our next steps after this. So um, another notable thing to um, bring to your attention is the Malibu fundraising entity donation. Um, we have, um, been told that there's about $165,000 worth of revenues for the 2021 school year. So we went ahead and, and um, placed that in. Um, and then there's 200 and 
And so what we've done is, is said that we believe in 21, 22, it should be about 275,000. And then we need to get them up to the 415,000 is what their, their normal expenses are per year. So we wanted to go ahead and reflect that in there. Um, then as we um, scroll down, you can see how the revenues actually um, have dropped from our, from our estimated actuals as to whenever we, we gave you um, back at our last interim. But um, so it has dropped and we do increase a little by little um, within each of these years on revenues. Then um, something notable that we didn't um, talk about last time, and I did say it in, the, in the, one of the slides that we were talking about before, but certificated um, salaries. Um, we did go back and we did some adjustments and we did an offset with our lottery funds and it brought, it brought this down by about 1.4 million, I believe it is, um, from the 53.9 to the 52.8. Um, that's on sal um, uh, certificated salaries. That also follows suit within line 31 um, within benefits because whenever this drops, all of the benefits pieces actually drop that are attached to that. Um, we just carried forward what we believe at 1.5% one, at 1 um, increases for all salaries um, within um, step and column as well. So that has been adjusted for within there. Then um, I'm, there's not a whole lot of differences here. We didn't do a, a lot of changing within, uh, within these areas of, uh, excuse me, of other operational costs um, and your travel conferences, your dues and memberships and um, rentals and, and leases and what have you. So I'm not going to do go line by line within this. I know that all of you have had a, a chance to look at this because I've heard from quite a few of you at this point in time. Um, we have already um, pretty much implemented the stabilization plan um, that we had been working on over this last spring. And that was at about $8.4 million, although that's not reflected here. Um, and as we go across, I'll talk about these here in a moment on the, on the fiscal stabilization plan. So in, I think I talked, I know I did, I spoke to you about, let's kind of jump back up here really quick. I spoke to you about on line 19, Malibu fundraising entity donation, that 165,000. It, it is about $415,000 to run that particular program. So I'm bringing you back to line 65 at this moment. And in line 50, uh, 65 is the Malibu Fundraising Entity General Fund Offset. Um, we are not backfilling uh, the expenses for the lack of revenues there. We are going to try to match the, the revenues to, uh, or the expenses to what we have as revenues. And so those are some adjustments that we'll be doing. And um, the, you'll probably think, okay, so how 250? We're looking at 415,000, so we just did a, a, a subtraction within there, and we just wanted to be able to kind of show that at this point. As you'll see within the next year, because we were um, seeing a little bit higher revenue, I think it was the 275,000, so it's about $140,000 short of being able to um, make all their expenses at this point um, with the current programs that they have at this moment. Um, this brings us to this column where this is still in the 2021 year. So we're looking at a deficit of $7,092,062. And um, then you can see our beginning fund balance that got carried from the, the prior year. Excuse me, I keep getting emails. Um, and then um, our ending fund balance at $7.5 $7 million and our revolving cash that we have in there. And then you see our 3% contingency reserve is also within our ending fund balance. And we, I have another piece that, that'll um, show this as well. And then we, um, we allow it to go, we allow what we have as reserves up to two months of expenses, which is about $26 million, but there's $2.1 million there at this point in time. And as you can see, that kind of carries over from year to year. So um, we pretty much went through this um, the 21, 22, 22, 23 year, I've already basically talked to you about all the revenues and the expenses that are there. The piece that we haven't really discussed at this point in time is what are we looking at as a deficit or as a surplus? 
We do have a deficit, although you'll see this is zeroed out because we brought the deficit up here to the fiscal stabilization plan budget reductions. And so we're looking at $4,652,810 for the 2021-22 school year and the 2022-23, um, looking at $2,919,751 as a, um, a deficit. Obviously, these numbers will change as we find out more about these particular revenues and, and how that's going to and how that's going to look. I believe we'll probably be talking, I know for a fact we will be talking um, more in August as we hear what the true budget is from the state of California and um, what other things that, that um, might play out between now and then. I'm going to hop back over to our um, presentation. I'm going to skip these things because I just went through all that with you. Um, so our revenue projections as a pie chart, and, and you might think, okay, so how much of it is lo uh, other local and, and um, LCFF in state? So for LCFF in state, we have 65% of, the, of the, the chunk is coming from that area. We look at 3% for um, federal revenues and 2% um, in other state revenues. Parcel taxes are 8% are, um, of the budget. And then 6% of the joint use agreements um, is um, a, a portion. Smith brings in about 1%. Um, Malibu fundraising at this point in time is, is not being measured. Um, we have measure Y and GSH is 8%. And then our lease and rent rents are at 1%. So I will move past that one. Um, and then on our expenditure side chart, you can see that it, the salaries and benefits are at 86%. And that's due to some of the adjustments. I think we said 87% before. However, this 86% is including restricted and unrestricted funds. So that, you know, this, this is the whole entire pie at this point in time. Um, 20% of, um, of, of those expenses are, are classified salaries as well. And then 40% um, of, the, of the, that chunk is from the certificated salaries. And then employee benefits is at 26%. And then books and supplies at 2%. You've got services and other operating costs at 12%. And our capital outlay is kind of minimal. So our Indy Fund balance reserve, this is what I was talking about whenever I was showing those components within the, in the bottom of that. Um, you look at, um, you, can look, you can see that we're, we're ending at uh, 14,678,938, um, giving us the um, total overall 3% um, economic uncertainty. We got our 3% at uh, 5.2 million, almost $5.3 million. What I, once again, there's the um, revolving cash prepaid, and then um, this is for deficit spending, a little over $7 million for deficit spending in the, um, the next year. Um, our current reserve is at 8.4%, which is down 0.26% um, from 8.66 from the third budget revision on uh, May the 30th. And the statewide average, I continue to say this to you each and every time, our statewide average is approximately um, 17%. And in order to hit that, that up reserve up to two months in the general fund expenditure, um, we would need $26.8 million, and we're sitting at uh, a little over $2 million at this point. So for cash flow, um, we are anticipating that around November, within the November and December months, um, we will possibly be negative um, five to ten million dollars. So we are going to be um, creating a trans uh, resolution to bring back to you in the fall, and uh, more to come on that. And so our next steps would be to continue to monitor our property taxes, our basic aid status, and the state's um, budget process. Um, we will be bringing this back with any kind of um, um, changes or what have you that comes out of tonight's meeting. Um, on June 25th for uh, uh, board adoption. Um, we will prepare our board resolution for the trans, like we said, and then we will prepare any necessary budget revisions for um, board approval within the legal timelines, which is that 45 day revision after the final state budget adoption. So we are looking at either um, August the 6th or August the 13th to be bringing that information back to you. And um, hopefully maybe 
um, improving upon these particular numbers at this point. Everything else within this um, report is actually the, the appendix, so um, that's there for, you, for your um, pleasure to look at it anytime you like, and I will stop with that. Hey, thanks so much, Melody. You um, want me to unshare? Yeah, I would appreciate that. It's hard to just stare at a spreadsheet. I think I have to stare at rectangles. <laughs> um, we do not have public comments on this, so I will see if there are any board member clarifying questions, and remember that this will be coming back to us on the 25th for, uh, for a vote. Maria. Just a question, Melody. I know that you, you included uh, the amount for our, 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 our um, amount for child, develop, for child development child care. Yes. Is that going to be removed if we do not open in the fall? Is that money? That is some a discussion I think that we definitely have to have. Obviously, if, there, if we don't reopen in the fall, there wouldn't be a need for it. But um, I think there would be some need for it um, because we have, let's say we don't open in the fall, but we open in January. So we might just put it in there as a placeholder. But I think that's a conversation we all need to have. Oh, okay. So is this something that's going to be done tonight or next week? Or, or is it something, well, before I, before I ask that question, let me preface it by saying, are we then, um, saying that the budget is going to be very fluid, at least from now, you know, like, even though we, we will vote on a budget next week, it's going to be fluid enough depending upon how um, the state moves a budget or it other very, in the city. It is very possible that this is going to be fluid. Hopefully it's not too extremely fluid. Um, we are very conservative in this budget as well, just, just so you know. Okay. Yeah, I was going to follow up on that, Melody. It, it seems like while, while we know it will be fluid, Hopefully that the surprises that we see will be good surprises because we are being conservative with our assumptions. Like I know that the state, like we've had some emails from, from members of the public. The state is talking about all kinds of things about backfilling, bringing some of these funds back. We are budgeting based on what we know as of today. You're absolutely right. Okay, Thank great. You. So I hope the surprises fine. will be yes. good ones. Are there, are there any other clarifying? Uh, yeah, Ralph. Ralph, you're on mute. Still on mute, buddy. Unmute. There you go. Okay. Um, thank you, Melody. I, um, I know it's hard. So the CDS monies that you mentioned, the $1 million and the other monies, um, again, per what John just said, we're just saying that that money's there because we're assuming we're going to have preschools like we had last year and that money's there. Yes, you're absolutely right. I'm always an optimist and I believe that we're gonna go back. <laughs> and so we, we believe we're gonna have childcare and, and we, we have to put it in there. So I, if I don't put it in there, then I would be remiss not to. Right. Well, I guess Susan is, is shaking her head. I don't, so what's, if I can ask, kind of what's that status of all that? Hey, we, hey Ralph, um, it's this, actually our, our, our major action item C4 is gonna be about CDS. So yeah. is it, can right. we have the discussion? at that point is that cool with you yeah okay sure. um so then let me ask I, i'm i'm confused i can't remember who, who who explained this to me but um if i look at each site's budget the literacy coaches and the stretch grants are line items where is the ps arts money show um, I believe it is also within that same piece. If you're looking at what I think you're looking at, I could probably pull one of those up super quick for you. It's any one of the school budgets. Yeah, yeah, it's any one of the school budgets. It should be across that line item there. Gerardo, do you, you, you look at this daily. Do you remember? So that I, mean, I could pull it up for us if, we, if that's what we wanna do. So that was coming um, from the Education Foundation funds, and I do not believe that they are exact line items, but it looks like Dr. Mora has um, something to add. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you for that. For the Ed Foundation, it's, they fund the instructional assistance and the stretch grant. The instructional coaches um, are funded through a combination of our base funds, which is you know, our unrestricted and our supplemental grant. So what you'll be able to see there is um, how that is delineated. But where's PS Arts? PS Arts, it's not included at the individual sites because that is a contract that's district wide. So that is then, that is something that we receive as 
in Ed Services and we pay out of Ed Services. Okay. So that, okay. That's why you don't see it um, delineated in each respective school. I, I thought it might be that, but let me go back, Melody, and, you know, to have this conversation. Is our budget assuming that we're backfilling both in Santa Monica and Malibu any dollar that wasn't raised? To pay for the programs? We're not back to them. We, we are because Melody said, if you go, you know, to the, that line 65 or whatever, that that negative number is to fund those programs. Correct. The budget negative, says. No, the negative budget number is not to. No, let's see if I can figure out how to explain this. Ben, do you want to touch on yeah. this one? Okay. We okay. are not, we, we are not backfilling Santa Monica or Malibu if the funds don't match the, 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 the amount of program. So that is what uh, the budget reflects. That's the amount that it's short, Ralph. That, that 250 that we, we had in that, that line item there. Well, Santa Monica is short also. So a, a bit, I don't know where, yes. where does that show? That, where does that show? Yeah, I, I, I didn't bring that in there. All right. So if I, if I may add, so one of the things that we are looking at is if we are short in funding, then we have to then begin to look at the additional programmings that are, that are supported through the, Ed, through the Santa Monica Ed Foundation in Santa Monica or um, LEAD in Malibu. Um, so those, those are, because it's not just, we have PS Arts, but we also have SMC um, dance that is funded through Ed Foundation, and we have our instructional aids and the stretch grant. So we are going to have to, once the once the fundraising is concluded, we are going to have to make adjustments to those services and programs. Um, if we don't have the dollars to be able to move forward, with it, whether that's PSR, so that's our SMC contracts, or any of the other areas. So I, I well, part so let me let me let me restate, uh, Ralph, uh, to to clarify. We don't know how much. Lead, uh, not lead, the PTAs of Malibu are going to give us. They're still in the process of fundraising over to June 30th. So is, so is Santa Monica Education Foundation. Once we get there, we're going to make those adjustments. Okay. So, so far right now, um, uh, they haven't told me that they were going to be short. Uh, uh, they, they said they're still continuing to fundraise, but they also know that we're not going to backfill in Santa Monica or Malibu. Right. Well, to be honest, I mean, every all the past years we have backfilled, you know, in both communities. Yes. Um, because I think the Ed Foundation, Santa Monica Ed Foundation has raised whatever, 80% yes. of funding those programs. So I'm just yes. kind of bringing it up so that everybody's aware and maybe, I don't know if there's a way to put out a list, you know, early next week that says, here's all the programs that are funded by parent fundraising in, in you know in the in the different schools this is what and, and ask you know, this is what we're going to be getting which means we don't have enough money to continue to fund these programs you know as they were and if the, if funds aren't raised you know before school starts that we will have to be you know making changes to really make sure that people understand I know in uh, I know in Malibu, I'm a, uh, the campaign starts. I believe it started today or tomorrow. Great. They have a whole letter. They have a whole game plan to explain all of that to the Malibu community. Uh, so that way, parents ha at least understand what's about to happen if the funds yeah, are we there. We want the kids, all our kids, to have all those programs. Yes. Um, I don't think you know in these times, particularly, people understand dance. You know, fifth grade. You know, ballroom dance or other things. You know. I, and which we may or not have, depending upon, you know, how we come back to school. But, you know, that they're, that we're like everybody else, everybody else's budget, our home budgets, our work budgets, everything, you know, um, that we may need some additional help in, in having those programs return, you know, at, at full force. And the earlier, you know, if we tell people that and they know it, then it's great that Malibu is stepping up right now and doing fundraising, you know. Yeah. Um, I think I have um, a document that, that'll help and I know we've published it um, at a board meeting before as well as with cabinet and um, uh, and the board. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen because I, I want to make sure that you know that we understand what you're uh, referencing um, and I think it's important to to know that. Um, this is the document that I think you're referring to where it shows all of the years that we've had 
uh, from the Education Foundation, and then the programs that those cover and the years that they were covered, and then you, you're referencing the backfill of the district, and that's what this is here. So you are correct historically. Um, that's what we have done. That's what the board has decided as a board to, to continue those programs and people. But Dr. Moore is absolutely right that, um, and Dr. Drotti, that there's a reevaluation that needs to occur going forward. Great. I don't know if I've ever seen this document, but I don't know if the rest of the board, but I've, I'm usually not in the room when you talk about that foundation funding, so. Um, it's actually always in your packet. Okay. We'll reshare it. Great. Yeah. Okay, do we have anything else clarifying before we uh, close our public hearing? Great, so that said, do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Motion by Maria, seconded by Ralph. Oscar, step too late. Um, so we'll do a roll call. Uh, Richard? Yes. Ralph? Yes. Lori? Yes. Oscar? Yes. Maria? Yes. And I'm a yes. Thank you very much. The budget will come back next week for, uh, for a vote. Which brings us to our major action item C3, adopt resolution 1950, recognizing and celebrating Juneteenth. So I will uh, ask Ms. Lieberman to present this. Um. Look how excited I got to move it before Ms. Lieberman got to like speak. I'm sorry, Lori. That's okay. I'm gonna, as is our tradition, read the be it resolved clauses. Um, a be it resolved that the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board of Education encourages our district's employees, students, and families to join in celebrating Juneteenth as a day to honor and reflect on the significant role that African Americans have played in the history of the United States and how they have enriched society through their steadfast commitment to promoting unity and equity. Um, that's the, the, the next clause is, is not relevant to the substance. Um, so maybe we should have a motion and then I do have, I personally have a comment, but. <laughs> so moved. There's a motion so moved by Richard, seconded by Maria. So we'll have uh, comments before the vote. Go ahead, Lori. My, my comment is that, first of all, the be it resolve clause does not even cover what's really in that resolution. So that I feel kind of strange about that. But more importantly, since our schools are not in session, and so what would would happen as a result of this us passing this resolution is we would pass it on to the sites and encourage that them to share. Um, I would like to suggest that along with passing the resolution, we ask the superintendent to either, you know, as appropriate in the next communications with our school community, um, that this resolution be shared. Because otherwise, it doesn't really have a lot of meaning other than we've stamped our approval of it and our recognition of it. But since we're not in school and no one can educate their kids yeah. about it, I, I'd just like to add yeah. that to the motion, if that's friendly. Yeah. Richard? Yeah. I, I, too, um, I'm very excited about this. Uh, and But I'm with you, Lori, that I want it not to be just performative. I want us to be able to say that we're doing something on the ground and uh, as educators. And um, I don't know if you were as appalled as I was um, with the president of the United States claiming that he's made this uh, a national, he, he's brought attention to this, that somehow he brought, I, I can't even believe that what he has said about this. Um, because Kamala he didn't Harris, know what it was. And so he just discovered it. And so he believes that other people just- Exactly. It. And that he's, you know, <laughs> uh, our Senator Kamala Harris today that, um, She's introduced a bill that it, tomorrow she's going to introduce a bill in the United States Senate um, for a national holiday. And so I would like at an, another moment for us to be able to actually uh, come forward with a resolution to support that effort as well. So that's going to be transpiring certainly in the days and weeks to come. Um, but I think that organizations and elected bodies across the country. Uh, Sorry. I keep seeing a Patricia Nolan name up here. Yeah, I see that too. Okay, so I, I will say for those of you who are looking for activities, if you if you are going out and socially distancing, 
uh, I believe tomorrow, Virginia Avenue Park, there is a, um, a rally. And then on Saturday at noon, there is a, a, a Juneteenth um, celebration commemoration uh, also at Virginia Park. So there are activities locally in Santa Monica for people who are, are interested. Um, so that said, um, do we have, uh, we have a motion in a second. Richard, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Ralph. Um, I mean, I think if, 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 since it's so, it's so new, it's so uh, fresh that it's come to us, uh, Ben, if you're going to include it in, in a message to, to the public, I think it, it needs to be framed. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that it be you know, framed in the context of some of the work we're doing, our support for Black Lives Matter, um, not just here's a resolution we passed. We've said that, you know, they, they tend not to lead to the kind of activity we might want to see and we can change that. Um, but you know, that, that this hopefully will, you know, you know to strengthen um, what our intentions are. Um, so I, at, at, risk of, at risk of gumming things up, would we prefer to have this come back to us on the 25th as a strengthened resolution? Or do we want to pass this now and then give uh, staff the chance to, to do what they need to do? Uh, I think it might, from my perspective, if you pass it, I think I'll take it and get to work. Okay. I can possibly bring you something on the 20, 26th to, to uh, describe what we think uh, we want to send out to the community. Okay, great. So that said, unless we have any other comments, um, we'll go for a roll call. We have a motion. No, no, I, I, have a, I have a question. Oh, it's, sorry. Go ahead, Richard. No, no. I just, how do the rest of us, how does the board feel about, um, I mean, because just you mentioned the delay, um, because potentially if it comes back to us next week, we could include as a part of our resolution, a call or, or declare our support for the national holiday in one, in one, in one motion, one resolution. I mean, it, would that be, but then we miss, we miss I, tomorrow. I personally would rather approve it tonight because I think the reason for bringing it tonight was because it's tomorrow. happening tomorrow. Okay, got it. Thank you. I was just, just musing about. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, I, I think I think the, the will of the board is to try to pass this tonight and then do more. So with that said, uh, I will do a roll call. Richard is a thumbs up. Yes. yes. Ralph? Yes. Lori? Yes. Oscar? Yes. Maria? Yes. And I'm a yes, so that's six yeses. So the resolution has been adopted and we look forward to building on that. Um, which now brings us to item C4. Uh, which is a resolution 1948 reduction or elimination of child development program permit positions and notify affected employees of recommendation of layoff. I'd like to uh, turn this over to Dr. Kelly, who will then, I believe, introduce uh, Dr. Smart Powell. Yes, thank you, President Keene, and good evening, board members and members of the public. So, before the board, really are two resolutions. Um, the first resolution is uh, approving a reduction and elimination of child development program permit positions. And, and then this also allows us to notify the affected employees. These are the certificated positions in the child development center program. As you know, uh, the programs have been operating in a distance learning way. We still don't know what we're looking at is come fall. The summer programs are typically running are not running. Uh, and so we have to be able to have the flexibility to bring the programs back to meet the needs and to uh, match the programs that we need, but also to match with revenue. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Susan Samarj Powell, who just makes some remarks and then I'll reinforce what she has to say and answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Dr. Drotty, Board President Keene, school board members, executive cabinet, and our community. Prior to the onset of COVID-19, Child Development Services, CDS, was in a fiscally sound position with a projected year-end balance of approximately $1.2 million. In October, we shared with you our dreams of continuing to grow our program even stronger for all of our families. We enjoyed some wonderful opportunities, including serving all students with equitable programmatic access, support in mental health in our preschools, and access to community connections for all of our families. Regardless of the program title, students have been offered opportunities to learn and grow. Our program and our students were thriving. This year, we have served 24 students in our infant and toddler center, just under 350 students in our preschool programs, 
and just over 700 students in our school age programs. When COVID hit, we followed the state, county, and district recommendations of closing all of our physical sites and programs. We also followed the governor's recommendations and made the determination to stop collecting family fees. While we no longer had a revenue stream from our fee-based programs, we have continued to pay all of our staff to support them during these very uncertain times. As the closure extended through the end of this school year, we have continued to pay our staff. In doing so, we have now depleted our fund balance and are unable to continue this practice. Unlike the TK through 12 school system, all of our programs are fee-based and they always have been. With no funding coming in from fees, a probable reduction from the state for our subsidized programs, and no certainty for when we would be able to have our students back in our programs on sites again, we have no choice but to recommend this layoff action. I feel it is also important to share that our decision to discontinue Head Start affiliation last year was a prudent one. Our Head Start eligible enrollment numbers did not come close to the requirement, which would have resulted in a lack of funding and layoffs actually occurring earlier this year. The district support has been a better way to meet the needs of our community as we have been able to serve students who qualify for Head Start, as well as those families who make just a bit too much to qualify for the entirety of the school year. All of our staff members have been paid through the end of the school year, and all staff will have their insurance covered through at least August 31st. Even during a typical school year, no staff would be contracted to work during the summer as they are considered school year employees. While many do work extra, this time is considered additional hours. The reason for the layoffs now is because of the length of the district layoff process. We have surveyed our families to see what their needs and their preferences for care in the fall would be. We're reviewing the data with detail this week, but at first glance of the 108 families who responded in ITC and preschool, 82% want us back on campus and open with their regular hours. Of the 328 school age families who have responded, 94% have indicated they want to return, want or need to return as well. This demonstrates our closure was not about lack of interest or issues with our programs. It is entirely COVID related. Our intent is not to close. Rather, we are doing this so that we have the flexibility for how and when we bring our staff back to work. As the district is still exploring options about how we return to school in the fall, it would have been fiscally inappropriate to retain everyone on a hope. However, we believe this is a temporary situation, so we may bring staff back as our needs grow, ultimately and hopefully in a stronger and even better capacity. Our CDS staff are amazing people, and I wanna thank them for continuing to work with grace and compassion for all of our families. I want to give particular thanks to Monica Simon and Rehan Debash, who have wrestled with this just as much as I have. I also deeply appreciate the support all of you have offered. Please know I hold that trust dearly. We are going to live up to it and work hard to make sure our programs return stronger and better than ever. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, Sue, I think what we, what we all respect and appreciate and love about you is <laughs> You are, you are here for, for our students and our families, and this is so clear right now, and this is, this is not where you want to be, and this is not the report you want to be making, and it's not the report any of us want to hear. Um, I do know Dr. Kelly wanted to speak after you spoke. I don't know if I can follow that while well. she did such a wonderful job of saying that. And, and the one thing I want to say is she, she uh, Dr. Smart Paul has such commitment to the students to the families, but also to the staff. And when, when we knew that this is how we needed to proceed, she scheduled a Zoom meeting for both the teachers and the child center workers will be affected by this. And just very, um, with great sensitivity and understanding and diplomatically, she explained kind of the rationale behind this. And, and many of them really articulated their thanks and gratitude to her for for being candid and honest with her. It is our hope that we're able to bring people back. Again, one of the things we've learned and I hope the board is remembering is that in order for us to make changes, in order to make adjustments, to match staffing, to enrollment, to the revenue sources, we need this flexibility. 
Um, we talked about something of a smaller scale. It would have been arbitrary. Um, we don't know what we're going to look at, look like in the fall. If we have no one on campus, that's going to really impact how they are. If we have some centers, we do have a skeleton staff in place because they are really taking and listening to all the guidance out there and are ready to move on a dime as quickly as possible if we're able to reopen and reestablish things. And so we are mindful of the other conversations we're having with regard to what's going to happen for our TK through 12 students. And so part of that conversation is also about uh, super child supervision and is there a role for CVS? We, that still remains to be seen, but this is some, something, unfortunately, we do bring before the board and ask for you to approve the resolution. The first one is that initiates that layoff process, allows us to provide notification to the employees. The second resolution is a tiebreaker resolution, and that's really about a reinstatement rehiring process when you have two employees who have the same seniority. So I'd be happy to answer any questions in Dr. Samar. Thanks, Paul. Dr. Kelly. We, we, um, we do have nine public comments on this item, but if there's anything clarifying that people want to know that could help uh, guide us on public comment, we're open to clarifying questions now. And if I, I actually have one for Sue, if you're there. Um, so we, we do have, we, we do in the budget as, as Ralph addressed and as Maria addressed earlier, there is money set aside right now for CDS. If we were to, if we have the ability to open up classrooms, does that money allow us to provide services for when we talk about the most vulnerable students and families in our community, the families that we've brought in recently, would we have the ability to, at a bare minimum, provide services for those families if we're allowed to provide services? So yes, and um, we, it does provide for those families, and we also still need um, some of our full fee families to be able to participate as well because that money coupled with the state money that we do anticipate coming in though at a lesser rate will still not cover all of our costs uh, but it will do a, a good amount towards that and so yes we would serve those students who have the highest need and from um from the students who would have qualified previously for head start they are in our state ranking system and so we would start, we are always duty bound um which is the way we've always done it all of our students who have the highest need get served first great thank you so much uh clarifying question ralph yeah okay. sort of a lot some of the same stuff i i guess typically you know when we have the budget with the departmental budgets would be in there but i guess there isn't one for CDS because there isn't one right now? That's a Melody question, I guess, or Gerard. Gerard, though. There's no CDS, you know, there's no CDS budget in our budget, right? So that's for the, in the general fund budget, that's, it's not in the general fund budget. It's uh, part of its own fund budget, which is listed. In right, the and there is no, and that doesn't show because we don't have that program set aside right now. Um, for I for, didn't find it if it's there. Uh, yes, for the year 2021, it's part of the narrative um, uh, that was attached because it's a separate fund by itself. All of these separate funds that were not the general fund are listed in the narrative um, for next year. So it, it's it's there. It's just in the narrative piece. But we don't have anything. But well, we have the million and plus. As of this current moment, the entire Fund 12 is budgeted um, as if everyone is coming back. That's wow. how, so we are projecting that all revenue streams are going to come to fruition when we know that's not the case. So that's also part of the August 45-day uh, budget meeting that we need to have with you guys um, is to know exactly where we stand for child development revenue. Okay. Um, Outside of the 1.2 um, interfund transfer. Right. Thank you. So, Susan, um, so just to clarify, so right now, we're not, we're not allowed to open up preschools? So, actually, there's never been a mandate that we have had to close. It came on the recommendation um, from... <laughs> obviously the CDC and, um, and the state yep. that we do, but we, we have actually been open virtually. So we've actually held all of our programs. We've held 
both infant toddler preschool and school age programs in a virtual capacity. We just haven't been present on campuses. Um, and we, we do anticipate that if for some reason we decided as a district we were going the distance learning route, we would still offer those opportunities. We just have heard from most of our families that most would not participate in that. Um, well, per what John said, the same question, if we were, the number we used, you know, when we switched from Head Start was 70. I don't know if that's still the number of, you know, of students. It could be more now um, with the economy the way it is. It, can we, what money, do we have enough money to run a program for our most vulnerable um, preschool students? In and of itself for the length of the school year, no, we don't. Uh, we, we, it do contributed we to parts of the, towards parts of the program so that that's, we always commingled our classroom uh, for our students with our state funded with our full fee families. And we would need to continue to do that. Okay, well, we could talk more about maybe when you come back, you know, what monies we would need to, to run, you know, to, to run the program that we think we're, we're going to want to run. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're still waiting on state funds as well. So that will also give us a better determination. They have still not yet come out with what their actual. Because um, this, this year wasn't our budget. Was it four or $5 million? Somewhere in that. For CDS? Yeah. We were just under $10 million. $10 million. Yeah. And, and how much came from the state? Uh, for, C, for the preschool programs, just about $1.5 million. And for the school age programs, about $1.2 million. So to say we're about $4 million is what we get between our money and all that money. The rest of it was fees. Yeah. Okay. Well, that gives us an idea, at least to start thinking about it. Thank you. And, and there's a specific breakdown in the narrative, um, board member Metro, if you, and it'll, it'll give you those answers to those questions you just asked um, so that you can see exactly where all those pieces are tied. Great. Um, and, I, and I do know that Dr. Samarj Pal um, is working with one of my um, accountants for the child development budget, as well as um, another staff member in getting the numbers because we do need to answer the question, how much um, money will the budget support for students and for how long. Um, so that's still an unanswered question that both my department and Dr. Samarja's department are still working on. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kelly wanted to say something before we get to uh, public comment. Yeah, uh, I just, before the board tonight is a, a resolution affected certificated employees. Uh, we have notified SEIU of our intent to lay off um, our child center assistance and a few other classifications. Um, that 30 day notice has gone to SEIU. Those, that layoff, um, those layoffs will come to be on the board's agenda in July 16th. Uh, the layoff is effective 60 days after that. So there will be some cost incurred from that be, uh, at the start of the school year. My understanding is that while the, the, the fund balance in CDS is really, we're going through it fairly quickly, there will be some slight, which you'll probably be able to cover some of those costs that we have to incur just at the very beginning of the school year as we go through the layoff process. It's a different process for classified, um, but there are some expenses there. I, I mean, I think I just wanna emphasize you know, part of why we're bringing this, absent something different and our ability to bring fee payers back into the program, unless, and I don't know that the board has the money to put more into it right now, this action really is why we're bringing this action to you right now. It's very Thank difficult. You, so uh, let's go to public comment now. We have nine speakers. Um, so Ms. Lieberman. Um, each, each of you will have three minutes and then Sarah will hit the buzzer on you. So please try to make your comments in that time period. The first three speakers are Adrian Hernandez, Jessica Gutierrez, and Wendy Gomez. And I'm, Sarah will unmute you when it's your turn to speak. All right, I'm looking for Adrian Hernandez. Yes. I don't see look under Hernandez. 
I don't see a name saying Adrian Hernandez. Oh boy, here we go. Um, <laughs> um, Let's say if Adrian Hernandez is here, please send a message through the chat room with whatever your ID is, and we will unmute you and get you. Turned on, is it? Yeah, the, there's no chat, but you can do the raise your hand feature, and the little blue hand will appear next to your name. Okay, that would work. And you know um, what? Let me, let me see if Jessica is here. Jessica, Jessica, Jessica is here. I can unmute let's her. Let's start with Jessica. Go ahead. Hi. Um, good evening, board members, Dr. Drotty and Cabinet. My name is Jessica Gutierrez, and I am a teacher at Samuel High. I'm also the parent of two children who have gone through CDS programs, including one who was currently at the Infant and Toddler Center at Samuel High. As many of you can attest to, being a working parent is hard. Um, as a teacher, you know, I want to be in my classroom with my kids as long as I can, but I also need to be with my kids at home. So having a daycare on campus with teachers that are caring and trained has been a godsend. Um, when I heard those teachers were going to get laid off, it just broke my heart because I truly feel like they're extension of my own family. Um, these last three months have been very challenging working with small children at home and trying to teach online and all of that. And while we made it work, and I know probably many of you did in your careers as well, I don't see that being sustainable. So whether we're online in the fall or in the classroom, I have no idea how I'm going to be working with young children at home. Uh, my husband works as well. Um, I also, more importantly, want you to think about some of our students. At Sam High, we have teen parents. I've had some of them in my classes um, and they rely on that. You know, it is, it is, it's hard for us to have kids, but it is hard for them and all the obstacles they go through. Um, and it's also an equity issue because many of them do not have access to any other options or they can't afford it. So I know you all have the best um, of, for our students and mine, I hope you do. And I just would like you to consider that with everything going on right now. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Sarah, did you locate Adrian Hernandez? I have not seen a hand go up and I haven't seen now. Okay, let's move to Wendy Gomez and then Nancy Flores. Wendy Gomez, let's look for a Gomez. There's a when, nope. I don't see someone named Wendy Gomez. If, if, if Wendy Gomez is on, just do the little feature with your hand and we'll, we'll I'll, I'll see you easily that way. I don't see anybody. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anybody. Uh, how about Nancy Flores or Maria Nancy. Enriquez? Nancy Flores. I see two other Nancys. Hold on, let me back up just to first initial. Let me look this way. I don't see Nancy Flores. And the next person was Maria, Maria Enriquez. Uh -huh. I do see Maria Enriquez and she's been Unmuted, trying, there we go. Great. Good evening, good evening board members, members of the community, Dr. Jurati, Dr. Kelly, Dr. Susan, Reham, and Monica. I just wanted to comment, um, my name is Maria Enriquez, obviously, and um, I've been with the district for almost 30 years. I'm one of the CDS teachers, um, very proud to be. Um, I may fumble over my words, but forgive me. Um, I just wanted to, show my appreciation to the board members. I hear, I've been in this meeting since the beginning and I hear in your voices and in your hearts and in your questions and your words, your drive to help us uh, help our program thrive and come back. Um, I understand how this is necessary um, and I understand how it can help, um, but I also understand the trouble that we're in. Um, but I do believe in your, I believe in, 
I believe in, I respect, and I don't envy the pressure that you all have on your shoulders to make this work for us um, and for our families and for our children with everything that's going on in the world right now, especially. Um, early ed is so important, and I know that you guys all feel that in your heart. Um, and again, I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Samarj, Reham, and Monica are being here almost 30 years. Um, I have never seen a stronger team fight for our program. I have never felt a stronger passion for our staff and a true sense of caring and understanding and empathy to who we are as teachers, as people, as parents, as caregivers. Um, I just want to put that out there. Um, I also have faith in you. Um, I appreciate everything that you're doing. And um, I know that you will do our best to bring our program back, no matter what that looks like. Um, I hope it comes back fully. I pray that it does every day. I, that's in my first and foremost prayer. Um, but I just, that's, that's my comment. I just wanted to say that for all our families and our kids who so need our program, um, I really trust and respect that you will do your best to make that happen. Um, and um, Dr. Kelly, I so appreciate you being there. Sarah Braff, I appreciate you being at all our meetings in the beginning of all this. I know it was super hard. As you saw, Susan, um, as she uh, gave her report, how heartfelt she is in having to do this at all. Um, and I'm sure it's the last thing she wanted to do, Monica. But um, that's all basically that I wanted to say. My faith in you is strong. And um, you will all be in my prayers every day with the weight that you have to carry on your shoulders. And I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker is Sarah Breff and then Cynthia Hernandez. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I'm here. Um, thank you for those kind words. Um, much appreciated. I know we don't want to do this, but I also know that um, Black Lives Matter and Brown Lives Matter. And to me, preschool and, and CDS are two of the ways that we have been successful at lowering the gap. If we don't have early childhood, we don't have the basis of education, and we don't have the ability to um, take care of our families, many of whom are in greatest need. They're mostly um, single family households and they're mostly head of households and they have to work. So whether we come back or whether we don't come back, we have to utilize these incredible professionals who do such incredible work and bring them back. Whether it looks a little different, sure, that may happen. But we really need to do, we need to find the way because otherwise that gap starts in preschool and doesn't and just continues to get wider. And we need to be aware of that. And of course, also for our wonderful professionals who have really been so strong in relationships with our students and families. And we don't want to lose that. And I know you will do your best. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the next speaker is Cynthia Hernandez, followed by Ismael G. Morales. I have not been able to find Cynthia. If, if you're here, Cynthia, do the little blue hand raise. I, but I have found um, Ismail. Where do you go? There. Yeah, let's see. There you are. Go ahead. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, board members, superintendent, community. My name is Ismael Morales. I formerly worked in the district for almost 10 years. Uh, nine of those years, I served in the Child Development Services Department in the district. At the same time, I worked at the former Juan Carrillo School. Uh, I did hear uh, at the department and the decision tonight was to issue layoff notices for school age and preschool program employees in the district. I am concerned about issuing those layoff notices for these employees. Many of these employees are part-time and enjoy doing their job. And of course, you know, I enjoyed my time there. Uh, my time there was fabulous before I moved to Phoenix, Arizona to become a classroom teacher here. Um, I think the item should, I, you know, I know knowing, uh, I mean, I wrote my comments before the whole discussion happened, um, thinking that the item should be tabled. Um, that's possible, that, that is a slight possibility. 
Um, I know that we need to determine the cuts that are necessary pre-COVID-19, and I know COVID-19 pretty much uh, disrupted everything uh, in terms of state funding and a lot of the questions, and I appreciate those board members stepping up and asking those important questions um, in terms of how much do we get in state funding. Um, I know that many of my friends that uh, were there, uh, they offered online opportunities. They, they still interacted with, the, with those kiddos and I was very happy to hear about that. <laughs> um, keep in mind that the after school programs provide an enrichment and homework opportunities that, are, that were offered. It is a safe haven for these kids, especially for many of these uh, working families. Um, I think the concern right now that I have is in fact, they can come back um, with the other resolution that might come up. Um, I don't know if these teachers, some of these teachers can come back based on their seniority. Um, I know that there, these are laws that we have to abide for, but that is something that in terms of how the numbers are gonna look like. But uh, I just wanna uh, take a moment right now to appreciate Dr. Simarch, Monica Simon. Uh, Monica Simon is an amazing person. She's a really, really, she's done a lot for the staff and for the kids. And it's time you guys to uh, think about this department more and looking forward to uh, more, of, more, um, more of your pro more of caring about the programs that they offer. They are really an extension to the school, to, to the curriculum and the social justice standards that you guys provide. And so, and I used to be a member of the inner, of the committee back then too, uh, with the Board of Education and a lot of the work that we did. And I think some, uh, a, a comment was brought up in terms of the equity issue. It will be an equity issue if we, maybe if we come back, uh, that is, that's, uh, that's really a concern. So I just hope that we take these words into consideration. And I want to say, Dr. Sumarch, you do a fantastic job uh, in terms of the, in terms of what you do for the programs. And I think, and I'm commenting from Arizona and I know the impact <laughs> really did for me uh, and preparing now I'm a school, uh, a classroom teacher out here. And, and I know Mark Kelly knows me very well. Um, but um, I think that, uh, I think that uh, we need to take a look deeper into the numbers and, and to think about these workers. Uh, they really, all of them, and a lot of them are considered like lifelong friends. And it was really painful to hear about that. And I really want to cry, but I don't want to, I want to hold back tears. I think we need to be very strategic in terms of what can happen. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, the last person on the list and then we'll see if we can find any of the others who we didn't find yet was is alexis nigele i'm not be pronouncing that right don't see let me try let me try it by last name hello oh there's somebody Here's can somebody. you hear me sorry i have my initials up Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for all of this. Um, I understand it's all really uncertain and difficult, and nothing for the upcoming school year is known or set, and appreciate how hard y'all trying to make this work. And I also want to agree with everything everyone said before me. Um, the CDS, SAP teachers, they're incredible. Monica, Leo, Zizi, Sylvia, just all of them. Um, my daughter's going into third grade at Edison, and it's just, it's been such an amazing program because, you know, we don't, not everybody has a yard. So there's a few things that are like intangible features, giving the children a place to play outside after school and interact with kids that aren't in their exact classroom is amazing. Um, these teachers teach manners, respect, cooperation, responsibility. It's, it's been a huge, huge part of our life. And I just want to um, do everything we can to support the continuation of this program and, um, and, and retaining these teachers and 
um, it's, at Edison especially, it's additional Spanish language exposure, um, which a lot of, it, in a social setting, not so much instructional, but more conversational, which is really special for um, our school specifically. But um, yeah, these kids just absolutely love the program. The teachers love them and the parents are um, eternally grateful. So you guys have done, a really amazing job and I hope it can continue. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, last chance to see if we can find Adrian Hernandez, Wendy Gomez, Nancy Flores, or Cynthia Hernandez. Sarah, can we take one last? Yeah, I've, I've been you can searching. Hear me? Adrian, been Wendy, searching. Nancy, Cynthia. And if not, um, we will take the matter back to the board because that will conclude the public speakers. Okay, let, let's move to public comment. I mean, to public comment, to board member comment. I, I think we've, we've searched. Um, if somebody comes up, we'll, we'll deal with the situation then. Uh, Maria is the first to speak. And do I have other board members who wish to get on the list? Or shall we wait? And Oscar will speak after Maria. And then we'll see where that takes us. So, so Maria, thank you, thank you so much for those that have made comments, Dr. Samarch. Thank you so, so, so much for that great report you gave us. I think a lot of us, especially myself, I made some calls today and um, was glad to hear that you were going to make a statement because I know that all the time that you've made presentations, they've always been so heartfelt, and I know how much you have been always so supportive of your department and the moves. And I think the support that you received from the board last year to bring the program home was because of that, because of you, because we knew your leadership and you, we knew what you could do with it. And so starting on that premise, I know that you, you did respond, Dr. Samarj, that um, we, Telcare wasn't necessarily closed down because from what I understand, it was still considered an essential kind of work that people could still do that. So my question, my question is this, and you said, and based upon, I guess, the survey responses, um, at least 50% plus of parents that um, would be bringing their kids back if they had the opportunity to do so. Um, but of course, part of it is the, pe the, the parents that, that are more, um, that are full base and some that are not, and those that are ranking up to, to that amount. Um, my question to you, I guess, and to you, Dr. Samars, Dr. Drati, Dr. Mora, um, Dr. Kelly, and, and, and Melody, is if at the point, because we're, we're, we're going to try to keep this budget as fluid as possible, but if we're able to, all of us work, not just only you, but, but uh, um, all the teachers that are involved, and the, and the teachers that I know we got email from them that are requesting um, um, support, you know, um, I guess I can't remember her name, the first teacher that said that she was there at Samuel High. So if we can all work together and are able to open up some means of offering child care, and maybe we can offer it at one particular site that's large enough to host, or maybe two that's large enough to host um, the, the children, so long as we're going to have parents that understand the dynamics, because they're their little kids, some of them will be toddlers. And, you know, toddlers are toddlers. They're not going to listen to, to, you know, stay six feet apart because they don't even, sometimes can't even count to six. So, you know, I don't know how we're going to do that. But if there's any way that, that understanding those dynamics and understanding that, in a sense, we might put you know, our lives in harm's way if we decide to do that for, for the workers and, and their families with little ones, I mean, I guess that's my bottom line. My, my question, I mean, mm -hmm. is if we can get, a, you know, people that are saying yes, moving forward, can at one point we look into possibly opening up, um, you know, very, not what we've had in the past, but in, 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 a, in an innovative way that we can offer childcare for, for, uh, for people, for our parents, for our families that need it. That's my just question. I don't, can we do that? So um, thank you. That's a wonderful question, um, um, Board Member Leon Vasquez. Thank you. So absolutely, we're working um, with options 
A through F right now, to be honest. Um, and we're really trying to work in conjunction with um, our TK through 12 partners to figure out what the reopening will look like. And so as we're discussing each option, as we're discussing each option at the school level, we're then considering how we make that work with our school age program. Um, so whatever option we have out there, we're trying to then merge to make sure it looks like this so that we can kind of connect what work needs to happen um, for our families um, who have that need. Um, in the Infant and Toddler Center, actually just today, Monica Simon and I were on with our lead teacher, Yale, about trying to figure out, is there a way that we can open even this summertime? Um, because uh, we have families who have that need, how do we make it work? Um, the, the biggest detriment for us right now in making it happen, the reason we're not open when you could be open at sites right now is truly the expense. Um, because right now the requirement from, the, it's an actual requirement with us from the state is that there are no more than 10 children in a classroom. Um, and as anyone who's ever worked with anyone who's under the age of four knows, you can't have one adult with 10 children in a classroom. That's like, literally 10 children is like 412 children um, at that level. So you'd have to have at least two staff members. Um, and for what our typical rates are, we are typically staffing for classroom rates in preschool at 24 um, or in our school age programs, 28 to 30. So to consider what that cost equivalent is for 10 children, in addition to having to purchase the PPEs and making sure we have the additional components of cleaning, of cleaning occur, um, that's why it hasn't, it, it just, ha we would be going further and further into debt if we were open in that regard. But that doesn't mean we're not planning to do an opening process. This is, the reason we're doing this right now is so we can say exactly what you said. All right, if we're closed at physical, sites, but we know we might be able to open one location, is that possible? And what would that look like? And how many classrooms would that look like? Or, okay, if we're doing a hybrid version and we know we can bring preschool back because they don't necessarily work with any of the other programs, what does that look like? So we definitely, that's all we've been doing. When we're not on Zoom meetings, we're planning. It's just, we don't have definitive answers right now as to what's occurring because of all the determination that still needs to be made. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah, and let me just kind of quickly follow up on that one. I know that the state is working on that budget and there's, there's a piece in there that we're kind of waiting to see, you know, but right now the legislature is, bat, is duking it out with a governor. So that's what it is. So I know there's going to be um, some meet, meet, meeting point between the governor and the legislature on this. But um, what specific do you, do you recommend? Because at this point, we just need to make sure we, if we can make, I think as a board, um, even if I understand the item and we move forward with, but as a board, we can make a priority that, that as those funds come back, whether we can prioritize those funds to go so that, you know, cause it meets many items and you know, making sure that these kids, you know, that we can go to a 10 to one situation, but that we prioritize some of the monies that we will be getting from the state so that they can be used to, to, to fill in this piece that we need to bring back. And, and I agree, I mean, I don't think every single child is gonna be coming back because this is something, a soul searching piece that families are gonna to have to figure that out, whether they want their children to come back. Yeah. It's a real, you know, and for teachers too, if they wanna come back. So it's one of those pieces that, that I'm hoping um, that teachers and, and families do soul searching between then and, and let's say by in the month um, or the middle of, let's, yeah, in the month, like the middle of July when things are, Hopefully we should be getting some kind of a better idea in terms of the state budget and where we go from there. So I think our next meeting is in July so that even though we, if we move on this budget item to today, that we have some flexibility come July to be able to open those pieces. And, and I would say, I would give it priority. Just based upon you, Susan, I would give it priority because I know you would know how to put it together. I, I, I really believe that you could. I really would give it anyway. That's my Thanks for you. So uh, Oscar's next on the list. Are there other board members who want to get in the queue? Okay, Oscar, and then yeah. we'll go to Ralph. Yeah, first off, I want to uh, thank Dr. Samarj for her uh, dedication and commitment and all the, uh, all the teachers in the Child Development Service uh, Department. Um, both of my kids, you know, participated in the, in the programs and I've been uh, just, I owe a lot of debt, you know, to those teachers who work so hard and we have a, and it's heartbreaking, you know, to see the layoffs. I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing um, to see that because we know that 
These are highly committed people that love their job, and, and I've witnessed that personally. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, I want to I want to support the comments um, from Board Member Leon Vasquez in terms of prioritizing, um, prioritizing education for our youngest students, you know, and especially at Santa Monica High School with the teen parents. I don't know how many can someone does someone have the the data on how many teen parents we have that benefit from childcare at Santa Monica High? Do we know that? This, this year we had two. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's very small. It is. Uh, I know that at one point it was like 18 and probably even more. So, you know, there's, there's been a change right. um, in that, which is a good thing. Right. But, but, but for those two parents, for those two teenagers that are students, um, you know, there has to be a way to find a way to support them. And then, and then, I, and then you know, I just want to say this. You know, I don't know of too many school districts that have childcare on site, like at the high school. I think it's the best practice and it's worth defending. It's worth protecting that model. And I know that, you know, we're gonna work um, to find those funds and as things open up, you know, there, 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 there'll be uh, an opportunity to, to reflect, you know, as we, as we move forward, as we said, we wanna be flexible with our budget. But I just wanted to speak and give uh, support, you know, to uh, prioritizing education for our youngest students and bringing those positions back um, as, as we see fit. So thank you. And thank you, Dr. Samarj, for your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, Ralph? Ralph? Sorry. Hey, Ralph, you're unmuted. There we go. Fat fingers today. Um, <laughs> So I found the, the budget page. So, so it's really the $3 million state money that we're assuming you know, once we, we have that or whatever, then you're gonna feel comfortable to taking the projections you have um, you know, with the restrictions we have on um, you know, how we, or social distancing and like how we can put a program together. Correct. Okay. Yep. So hopefully sooner than later. And again, you know, as, as I think everybody has said, you know, this is an amazing program. We all, we love the program. We love all the teachers. We love the passion you've brought to it to stabilize it. Um, so let's do what, do what we can. To, so let's all of us make sure the state funds this. We know for us it's $3 million that leverages into a $10 million program. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And, and, and just so you're all aware, we have wonderful members of our community who are very good public advocates um, for early education, um, actually, and in particular, Judy Abdo and our early childhood task force members have really, um, have really made their voices heard. And so it's definitely gotten to kind of, kind of, as Maria has said, it's gotten to the governor, like there is definitely that um, the push right now. It's just, um, as we were talking about the budget previously is, as, as, um, uh, we were saying before, I can't guarantee anything. So we just have to make sure we stay with that conservative information at this point until we hear otherwise. So, uh, Thank you, Ralph. And I, I think I'm, I'm the last to comment on this item. Um, I just want to say that um, our barrier to opening is, uh, is not desire. Our barrier to opening is the, is the limitations of uh, safety of our staff and safety of our children. And once we can figure that out, we'll go back to providing quality instruction for the for these students. Um, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by a few things. I'm encouraged by the fact that I think for the first time, I think our whole board has spoken with one voice in recognizing not just the value of, um, of preschool as an educational tool, but as a social justice tool. Um, and I think a lot of this is because of uh, the work that Sue Samarge and the CDS staff have done and Dr. Moore and Ed Services. Because um, the report that came to us last October showed us it wasn't just a feel good it showed us for the first time that the data was showing us that we were reaching more families that we had before that our students were graduating from our preschool programs and getting into kindergarten and having more success that it was working we finally found something that was working and now this virus is keeping us from continuing it so hearing that my fellow board members are committed to this as a priority to make this work as quickly as possible I, I, am, I am thrilled that we are speaking with one voice on this. The, the, the tragedy of tonight is that we are asked to, to lay off positions to allow us to bring this program back. Like every time we take a step forward, we get slapped in the face. But this is a necessity to give us the flexibility of coming back as quickly and as safely 
and uh, as possible. And um, I just, you know, it's like, I, we really appreciate what our staff has done. Um, our staff has trained so hard. Our teachers and our assistants have trained so hard to make this program what it is. And let's, let's hope that we get all our kids back as quickly as possible and get our staff back as quickly as possible because our, our, our community and society need it. So thank you, Sousa Marge. And thank you to your team and thank you to our speakers. Um, that said, we now need to take a motion um, for this item. Uh, so Maria is moving it. Do I have a second? I'm over, but let me, let me add something. Well, let me get a second, know. then I'll let you okay. add. Okay. <laughs> There's a catch. Lori seconded. So now we go back to common and okay. we'll go to Maria, please. No, just, I don't know whether, I don't know if it's in this part. I know we have a follow-up one and I don't know if the follow-up resolution in terms of, I think it's like figuring out who has more seniority, that piece, but either in this one or the other one, can we amend and just put in a, just one line indicating that we're giving this priority for, for when it does come to us um, in the same July or August of putting pieces back? Can we do that? Can we amend? I, I don't think you can. I have no Amend idea. the resolution? I don't know. I don't think, well, maybe Dr. Kelly has a different opinion than not. So Mark, you're the staff. Um, I think you can amend the resolution. I think it's important to remember what, what you're voting on. Mm -hmm. The first resolution is voting on um, the layoff, that you're authorizing the layoff. The second part of that resolution is that you authorize us to notify teachers that they're being laid off. That's what the first resolution does. The second resolution says, because, because all of the teachers are being laid off, there's no skip criteria, any of that necessary. But as we rehire, we have some teachers who have the same seniority date and we have to have a way to break the tie. And this is a way to do that. It tells us how we bring people back because you bring back the most senior person first, then the next most senior and so on. When you have people who have the same seniority date, you have to break the tie. That's what the second resolution does. To add a statement into these resolutions that the board, um, you know, supports uh, child development service programs and, and wants to make this a priority or you want to reflect that in the minutes, it's fine. There's really no harm. What we wouldn't want to do, what I wouldn't advise you to do, I should say, is to not give us this authorization because we need to be able to move forward. Um, this, isn't, this particular one isn't going to come back. What will happen is we will begin noticing they, the letters will go out tomorrow, employees will get them, and they know this because we talked the process through. They will get the letters that says they're being laid off effective June 30th. In July, what will come for the board is the classified layoffs then. And it won't come as a resolution, it'll just come in consent as a layoff as we've done other kinds of layoffs with classified staff. And so that's what'll come before the board in July, but this isn't coming back. Um, but if you want to figure out a way to add a statement of support or priority. Well, I, would, I would want to do that. I, I would want to make yeah, sure that I, it's not that we're, we don't want, I don't want it to stop moving forward. Right, right. I think it would be a great um, voice from the board for us to give that support that that we use the strength of support for our little ones. Marie, can I make a suggestion, a friendly yes. suggestion that um, we, we have it, we have it in our, our, our minutes tonight. July 16th is our board meeting where we're going to talk about how we're going to reopen. Would it be acceptable to come back on July 16th and add our CDS reopenings to that conversation? Is that doable for staff? Or is that so, so at least we could say on July 16th, this is how we hope to, to roll out our CDS opening. As, as, I don't know if I can put that in front of Dr. Powell, Smart Powell, that quickly, but is that a realistic thing? Is well, that I'm, acceptable? We're working on it, and as long as you all have said it multiple times, as long as everyone knows everything is fluid and dependent upon what's occurring. Um, I mean, I think we've been working closely, Dr. Moore and Dr. Drotty and I have been working closely with all of our administrators to try and make that a, a reality anyway. So I think that that's, I think that is doable to the greatest degree possible. But Maria, I'll defer to you for what you, what well, you should do for this. I, I understand it, it, but for me, it, it really would make set, set, a, set a stage for if we would be able to put one line, even if it's one line due to the fluidity, due to the, the 
you know, whatever the, the, the economic situation, we would like to, the board would like to prioritize the return of these <laughs> programs in, in, you know, back as soon as possible, if possible, give it the first priority, something like to that effect. It's just a one line, whether it's in the first, let's say the, the first uh, resolution or, or maybe the second resolution, it doesn't matter, but I think it would make, um, it would make a statement for where I think the board stands. But maybe it should be outside of the resolutions. I, I mean, I'm, I think we're all sort of in thinking similarly to you, Maria. But, but can we do that even though, I mean, it's not. I mean, it's sort of board direction. We're already, we've already been talking about it being a priority yeah. and the reasons for it. I've included a, a sentence in the minutes. Okay. If you, Maria, if you want to see if it, it meets what, what your goals are. Well, I don't um, think it's my goals. I don't want it to oh, no, no, I, you know Maria I mean. go, but I want it to be no, the No, no, you goals. know what I mean, though. Like, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, right. yeah. Um, so it says the board expressed its desire to make these programs a priority for reinstatement as soon as is practicable once schools reopen and funds are once again available. Does that meet the, the, the spirit of what we're talking about? Um, I guess, and, it, and that would come like what, at, at the end of the, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be actually in, in the actual resolution, but it would be like outside. It's on like the page comment. of the official minutes following the, the motion and the vote and everything. And, it's, and it gets published with the minutes and it gets um, a, a, um, sent to human resources along with the signed resolution and it becomes a part of the minutes. I can be so you know absent about so pigheaded about this piece, but can <laughs> this be put in in the second resolution? I mean, it's a nice line, but it, it would mean so much more if it was actually part of the resolution. I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion then, and I, I know how much we hate crafting um, dialogue from the desk, dais, yeah. but since I'm at my desk where I write, I'm going to give it a shot. Okay. Um, which would be so after the second whereas, we would add an additional whereas, something along the lines of whereas this action is being taken to the economic situation caused by the COVID-19 virus. And, and the priority of the board is to reopen and reinstate CDS programs as soon as safely possible. I like that, that's good. But yeah. it's almost like the, the board, the second one, there has to be like a priority word somewhere in there. Okay. I think I said priority, yeah. Said that. It's the oh, board's you, priority, okay. yeah. Okay, all right. And that would be in this resolution or the second one? That would be in this resolution. In this yeah, first one, okay. In okay. this one and the skipping one. Okay. All right, so that, that would be the good. third whereas. The third whereas, whereas. And okay. Sarah, I can send you that because um, I wrote it down. Okay, so, thank right. you. I move we add that third whereas. Great. Is there any more uh, uh, comment on this? You have to take a second on adding that. Oh, oh so I need a second I for thought, that. Well, Wait a minute, I had already made the motion. Made so motion and I she made the motion. Right. Yeah. So, so that's a friendly amendment. So, Maria, is that friendly amendment acceptable yes. to you? Yes, it is. And Lori, you're acceptable with oh, that? Yeah. I think we have a perfected. Right. Aren't we the motion and motioner and the? <laughs> yes. So I think yes. we're good. Our parliamentarian, Richard, are we okay? Great. So let's do a roll call. Richard. <laughs> Richard is a yes. Uh, Ralph. Yes. Ralph is a yes. Lori. Yes. Lori is a yes. Maria. Yes. Maria is a hesitant yes. Oscar. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oscar is a yes, and I am a yes. So that is six votes, and I appreciate you, Maria, adding the priority, uh, our priorities into the resolution. No, no, I think that you yeah. said it earlier, uh, John. I think it's, you know, we have to begin to start gelling as a board as these issues are hitting so hard to home that we need to move yeah. it forward like that. So right. thank you. I, Not me, it's thank you to all the board, to all, thanks to all of us. Yeah, no, I appreciate thank that. I appreciate you saying that. So it brings us to uh, major action C5. Adopt Resolution 1949, Determination of Seniority. Uh, Dr. Kelly has already introduced this. Do, does anybody need more information from this? Or can we take a motion uh, for this at this point? So Richard has moved it. Do I have a second? Maria has seconded it. Are there any more questions on this? I know Dr. Kelly has covered it. Okay, so we'll do a roll call vote. Richard is a yes. Uh, Ralph? Yes. Is a yes. Uh, Lori? Yes. Yes. Maria? Yes. Oscar? Yes. And I'm a yes, so those are six yeses. Uh, wonderful, so that's the end of our major action items. We have one general public comment tonight. So, Ms. Lieberman. Our one public commenter is Wendy Dembo. So, Sarah, if you can unmute her. Hi. Wendy, you'll have three minutes. 
Thank you. Um, I, I know you guys have a lot of really tough um, decisions to make. Um, and I just want to let you know that the Santa Monica Y just canceled their Big Bear camp definitely for the summer. They were going to have 46 kids instead of 150, which I feel doesn't bode well for school coming back into session as it has been or even um, as it would be. I'm very concerned about the quality of the distance learning. Um, my daughter was just had work dumped on her. She had no um, interaction with her teachers. She had no, no one was actually teaching her. She was like a college student just doing work or like independent study, which as a sixth grader, um, I didn't really think worked. I heard at Franklin, they had a lot of groups that would have breakout sessions with their classes. And so the Zoom, so at least the kids were able to interact with one another. Um, and so <clears throat> I'm just really, and we as parents we're not getting very much information from you um, regarding any of your thoughts if you're gonna have your goal is to have maybe some kids go to school one week and not the next week or you know maybe in the morning or maybe in the afternoon I, I think you just have to let parents know what's happening and um, one thing I know recently um, I just spoke to my friend and he, at his company, he and his other founders took 70% pay cuts. Everybody at his company took a 30% pay cut. And I just heard that um, some of the superintendents got raises and then got, they have $400 a month car payments. And I just feel like in this time when every dollar counts and should be spent on teachers and educating the kids, I, I just am kind of concerned that people are getting um, bonuses, you know, I mean. Nobody's getting a bonus. Well, I heard that that was, they were getting. Um, Hernandez. Hernandez. <clears throat> sorry, that they were, people were getting like good job bonuses or something. I'm not sure, but I just feel like we, the teachers, we need to the education that my daughter had for the last 10 weeks of school was just nothing. That's all I'm saying. I know it was an emergency. I know it was very difficult, but um, I heard about other schools where people, where kids were actually learning. So I just want to make sure that that's something that you're, I, I feel like you can't fire all these teachers. We're just going to need more teachers. We're going to teach kids online. They're going to have to. So I don't. I don't know where you can make cuts. I don't know, but you need the teachers. So thank you. Great. So that is the end of uh, general comment. I think it's. I know we're not supposed to engage in this. I think it's worth mentioning that we. Uh, that the superintendent has already set up um, uh, three larger town hall type meetings. I believe an email went out today. For the public to hear about the plans for uh, opening up schools, the options, the medical data, uh, and it's a chance for the community to give us feedback, and then it will drive our decision for July 16th. So the information is coming, uh, and there will be more happening in the next few weeks. So please keep checking your emails and participate in those uh, in those uh, gatherings. We have one information. We have one information John. item. Yeah, sorry. It's Richard. I just also um, want to make sure I, I know that um, I'm sure Oscar can attest to this too, but as a, as a member of the community who has a child, we have children in the district. I just want to thank our district staff for the, um, the frequent and very detailed messages that we're getting um, as to what the process is and how things are unfolding. And so um, I, I, I want the community to know, um, and as a parent myself, we we're getting these emails and and I'm looking forward to our meeting in July and also um, the, the, the survey that went out to the, the community. So I really do feel that the district staff has done a, a really wonderful job in um, making sure that everybody knows that this is a multi-step process and coming to a decision. And I think that um, I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, TJ. Um, 
we have one information item, which is the rescission of final layoff notices. Um, and then uh, that is, oh, sorry, Maria, yes. Does that mean everybody comes back now with that? Dr. Kelly, what was our final? Did we get below six? Dr. Kelly? So where we're at right now is that we have 49, no, I'm 43 of the 49 layoff notices have been rescinded. Um, there's one other possibility that's potentially in the works. Could I be any obscure on that? Um, <laughs> but, um, but the rest I think will hold unless something else changes. Great, thank you, Dr. Kelly. Yeah. And folks, that is it for our agenda tonight. Oh, it's I, not I it feel, for I'm feeling tonight. very empowered tonight, so I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to speak out. Um, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to, to for, for those that are still on the line for the parents and maybe who will see it and the community that will see the, you know, we play our, our meeting later, is that I think the, the, everybody in this, in the Holy Nights has had to shift. Everybody has had to shift in the way they run their lives in the last two to three months. And I think we as a, as a, as a school district have, have really moved as fast as we could, as much as we could. But I think that, that, that we always get those, those, those emails that sometimes are not, are not very nice, let's put it that way, which in a sense, it only to me reflects on your particular um, maybe uh, situation with your child or whatever. But I think that, that if we want to really move this district forward and if we're gonna do something really positive, I think it's like between the teachers have to step up and, and that just can't hold their hands up and say, I can't do this. But that to put on whatever they need to, to make it work and move it forward, move the education forward for all our kids. And if you don't, and if like myself, I did, I'm not a techie person, but I've had to become more techie in the last 60 days. And, and with that means that I had to acknowledge that if I didn't know the answer, that I didn't know how to do that, I would have to connect up with my staff to show me how to maneuver my computer, how to move to do Zoom, how to move to do whatever I needed to do. And I think we all have to do it in a way that, that we don't hold and start pointing fingers but that we, you know, go in there and say, what do we need to do to make sure that we can bring back, if we're going to bring back kids in the fall, what that, what that will look, that, look like, but that we're all coming because we, we really care for this district. I think we, we, we have great, great teachers. And so for those teachers that have already been trained and, you know, at, at teacher's college or has gone to, you know, whatever other, um, trainings that they have, please step up because we're going to need you in order to, to help, you know, those teachers that need just, just a little, you know, help in trying to get, you know, on board to make sure they're doing these great, you know, um, uh, uh, was it lessons, you know, on Zoom and so forth. I'm having to do programming in the fall and that's what I'm going to be doing all summer is figuring out how to, how to do programming online in the fall. So, you know, it's never, it's, it's not a done, it's not a doomsday, but I feel that we have now the opportunity to really take advantage of it and move it forward to something more positive in this district as a whole. I mean, that was my whole thing of making sure that tonight as a board, we hopefully are linking, we're not there physically together, but we're all linking together and supporting this district to make sure that we're supportive of all changes coming forward and that everybody steps up. You know, everybody does their small part to making sure that however we come back, whether it's all online, whether it's a hybrid, whatever form, that's going to be the best that it's going to be because we're all in it in, in, in what they saw heart and corazón that we're putting into this to make sure that our kids are, 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 are going to be educated, especially when we talk about equity. Come on, folks. For many of us, we all live, you know, we might have our homes like somebody mentioned with backyards. There's some that don't have backyards. There's some that only have family of five or six, maybe 10 living in a one bedroom. And this is all they have, but you know, we can make it work for them. And whatever we can do for those families who are not in the same situation as some of us who are in better economic situation that we need to just step up for all of them, for, for them more so, and just for everybody at large in the district. And that's my two cents here, or maybe 10 cents worth. And well, thank you. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you so much, Maria. Now I always appreciate uh, your thoughts. And that is, that is the end of our meeting. It's 7.30. We can all go ahead. Oh, 
I'll try to tell my family 7.30 dinner. <laughs> but, <laughs> but real quick. God, yeah, no worries. Just real quick, uh, uh, in, in closing board comments, um, I, I know uh, last meeting I talked about the need for a diversity and hiring report and looking into policies to have this as an annual thing uh, to ensure uh, diversity and, and, and hiring, retention, all that. And I was a, I talked to uh, Superintendent Drotti about um, getting us the uh, report that was conducted by uh, Deborah, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. Washington? Or Washington. Deborah Washington, yes. Deborah yeah. Washington. So that so that that that's that that sets the foundation. And, and Mark, I know you you're aware of that report, and um, and I know that you can put that data be, uh, together because uh, you've had those reports in the past. Um, I think when Peggy Harris was here, we would we would have that more on an annual basis. Um, the other thing is a report on ethnic studies, which I think um, Dr. Mora uh, also uh, acknowledged that we can bring some uh, something back. But there's one more item that I want to add to the list. Uh, along the lines of racial justice and as, uh, reassessing sort of, you know, we have all of our schools named after various uh, prominent, you know, white leaders in our country, mostly presidents. Uh, Will, I went to Will Rogers and uh, he actually is a very diverse person. I, I, I learned more about him as I went there, but I would like staff to look into that. Um, assessing sort of the naming of schools and not, we, we named the school uh, uh, after president uh, and, uh, 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 Michelle and uh, uh, Barack Obama, which I think is a step in the right direction. And, and we, should, uh, we should continue that discussion. It shouldn't end there. I think we should really uh, do an assessment. You know, how many schools do we have? How many are named after uh, you know, more white men? Uh, what, what would be a, a path for us to diversify the naming of schools? And, and do we have any, uh, any features, uh, any murals, any, any uh, statues, anything that's uh, in our schools that would uh, be considered sort of out of line or, or you know, offensive. Uh, I think just an assessment of that, I think would be very good for us just to open up the dialogue on that. Um, so anyway, I just want to recommend that, that third item as well as we move forward. Great, thanks Oscar. And as a follow up to, uh, to your request from last week, um, we did have a conversation. We, uh, Lori and I had a conversation with Dr. Drotti and we started to outline the framework of something staff could work on, which would be sort of a social justice report, the items that, we're, that we've done, the items we're working on, where we hope to be. Uh, we have all the different categories. Dr. Kelly will be, could be a part of that. Dr. Mora, Satinder Hawkins can be a part of that. All the different, so, and we can add what you just brought up to that, to that report as an element of it. And I think it'll give us, a, it'll be a, a great living document for us to, to really work on. So I appreciate you bringing that yeah. second part up. But John, more than just a document, I understand Oscar, mm -hmm. where you're coming from in terms of, but for me, they're just reports. So yeah. for me, there has to be from those action items that are going to be moved forward to make changes. Yeah, that's absolutely the yeah. goal. Reason. You have so, to identify yeah. where you've been, actually where we are, and the things that we are going to do. And because like Oscar was talking yeah. about, what is our timeline? Let's stop. Let's, let's speed up the timeline. So when we have it all there, I think we'll be able to do that. But I think the first part right now is to make sure that we're going to have whatever pieces are available yeah. to see how we're going to open school for all the kids and the, or, or not. I mean, that's our main, main priority besides, you know, the education for, for our, our littlest. But... I think that has to be an end with it comes the other. Of course, our plates are always going to be full of, thing, of, of items, but I think we shouldn't lose, lose sight of the fact that we still need to make sure that, uh, we, that the whole thing about coming back and how we come back in the fall is going to be very much more important at this and point. Just so we know, the goal, the agenda for the board is for July 16th for us to make, our the staff will make a recommendation on July 16th. It will be the first time we as a board can say, yes or no to a tangible plan moving forward for the spring for uh, for the fall and i believe our town halls are june 30th july 1 and july 7 but don't quote me on that which would be a chance for our community to talk about elementary secondary and our malibu community talk as well i think we're going to hear from a lot of our community and july 16th is the date sounds good okay so even though we didn't have board member comments on this agenda we did well thank you all very much this meeting is adjourned all right. thank you thank, thank you, you everybody thank you